Thank you, Master. Hallelujah. You know, the, the word tells us about the removal of the bride called the rapture. The, the blemish-free ones. Amen? And there's something about, he says, before the rapture, uh, on that event of the rapture, there's going to be something that happens. First of all, the tabernacle of God will be built again. The, temp the temple. Amen? Because in that, in that temple, the Antichrist himself will step in there and proclaim to be God. And the world will bow down to him. And they will be deceived. Because they'll be deceived without the Spirit of God. But in the meantime, God is doing something powerful. He's building his tabernacle. So what's happening is, is he's increasing and in building his tabernacle. And the extension of his tabernacle is called temples. Everyone say, I'm a temple. And in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 1, It says, now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. A minister of the sanctuary, which we are in right now. Amen. And, and it doesn't become the sanctuary until the people of God come in. <laughs> a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected, not and not by man. The Lord erected. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law. That is according to the law of creation and the law of commands. Who serve the copy of the shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern which I show you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on the better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, which means bondage, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their mind, in their thoughts. Write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor, and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. In that he says, a new covenant he has made, the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. <clears throat> so we see here that there's a sanctuary, there's a tabernacle, there's a sanctuary, and there's a covenant all associated together. Jesus is the high priest. The laws, he says, and I'll put my laws in their mind in this new covenant. Well, we have to look at something in the tabernacle itself. The most holy place carries the Ark of the Covenant where the law was put in the Ark of the Covenant. Does everybody understand? That's where the most holy place was. And the holy place was the area where the priests hung out and they did all of the rituals. And then there was the outer court. So we see that the most holy places where the law was given, in other words, that's the mind. That's associated with the spirit. See, you and I are made of a spirit, soul, and body. The outer court was considered your body. The holy place is considered your soul, which means it must be converted. 
And the most holy place is your spirit, your new man, your new creation, where you know all things by the spirit of God, with a divine nature always awaiting to assist us in every way. So we are actually a temple of the tabernacle in every area. So what's happening right now is God is establishing and perfecting his temple. He's establishing what we call the tabernacle. So when we come together, it is the temples of God coming together into the sanctuary to establish the tabernacle of God. Is everybody with me? Cool. He said it wasn't made by man, but by God. A temple for his dwelling. It's a temple for his what? Dwelling. In John chapter 2. He's not restructuring it. He's rebuilding it. In other words, he's multiplying it. In John 2.13. Oh, hallelujah. Is everybody there? Let's speak it together. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords. Oh, I wish I was there. <laughs> hallelujah. I wanted to see Lord in action in this one. He drove them all out of the tabernacle and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that what was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. <laughs> zeal for his house has eaten. So the Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show to us since you do these things? And Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them. And they believed the scriptures and the word which Jesus said. See, so what's happening right now is God is beginning to clean out the corruption that was allowed in the temple, or what we call the tabernacle, and put things in what we call holy order. Now, we just did a teaching on holy order. So everything that is corrupt that we don't even see or know, he's going to expose in every area. He said, don't make my temple into a merchant. In other words, it's things where you sell from. Because it's worldly. Why? He says he does far above all we could ever ask or think. He is our provider. In Matthew 26. So we are in such a great time of rebuilding the tabernacle. And the tabernacle is built with a sanctuary and temples. And it's also associated with a new covenant, which is called the covenant of the ministry of the Spirit. Amen. Matthew 26, verse 36. It says, Then Jesus came with them to the place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to his disciples and he found them sleeping. That's what the enemy does. Every time you try to do something for God, he tries to put people to sleep so they can't do it. In fact, much of the body of Christ is asleep these days. 
And he came to his disciples and found them saying, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. That's why many enter into temptation and fall. He said, The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. Now, what was he doing? He was cleansing every chamber of the tabernacle. He was praying for every chamber of the tabernacle. It says that he, w he actually went three times to pray. Jesus died on the cross, but he first died in the garden. He died to what? Himself. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. And he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand. And the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Let this cup pass by. In other words, Jesus knew that he had to clean up all the corruption and rebuild, not restructure, the tabernacle and temples. But he wasn't going to rebuild the te temple with hands of man. He was going to allow his spirit to build the temple with humans. So you got to look at something. When he says, Lord, let this cup pass me by. Think of every sin, transgression, or iniquity that is in the world. Every one. Every sin that you can think of. Every evil, wicked thing that can be done. He was going to take on himself into his body. Every Every sin, every transgression, every iniquity, every evil thing he was going to take and put on himself and allow his father to destroy it all. Jesus could not get into hell unless he was qualified. He had to become a sinner. He became a sinner on the cross because he took everybody's sin, transgressions and iniquity, which allowed him to go into hell. And he said it three times, Lord, if this cup, if I have to do this, I will. Why? Because he was looking through, he was not looking at himself. He was only looking at establishing the will of God, the will of his Father. That's why he came. He must take of the sin of corruption on himself and his body for all humanity to have access through his shed blood into his life to allow their bodies to become temples of the living God. There had to be an exchange made. In Acts 17, 22. Rebuilding the tabernacle. So as you find yourself going through wonderful trials and tribulations, <laughs> it's a part of the cleanup. It's cleanup time. And most of us, you think about what's going on globally. Amen? All of this corruption and lies and deceit and so forth. People are just, they're going through it, aren't they? People are finally getting the mask off, the veil's coming off, you know. Not in every state, and we're still battling these demonic politicians and so forth that are of the left. But the body of Christ is going through it. Hard-pressed. Persecuted. I don't know if you've seen... How many Jews are being persecuted and beat up in New York City? It's disgusting. And they're not doing anything about it. Promoting this vaccination that's causing harm to humans. And nobody's doing anything about it. Some of the people are finally standing up and realizing. I mean, come on, if the FDA doesn't approve it and Red Cross won't even take your blood if you've been vaccinated, I'd say there's something wrong with it. People will probably walk through metal detectors and go off like crazy. <laughs> Hallelujah. But we are in a time of such hard press 
challenges, cleaning up. And the word tells us that the people will get worse. Many people will get worse and there will be more imposters, more false prophets. We see the prophets of Baal running the media. But then there were those who come out. The Lord says that I'm going to run you through the fire, amen, and bring you out like gold. He's preparing for his return. But he's preparing and establish his tabernacle with his temples. Because it's you and I who are the temples of God who will be the restrainers. We'll be the avengers. We'll be the executioners. But the things that we decree on behalf of him. But you got to know him. You got to know him. You don't know about him. You must know him. You must carry his presence in his, in his glory. See, when you and I are first saved, there's a presence of God that dwells within. His, the purpose of the presence of God that dwells within is to clean it up. Then there's a presence of God that comes on for service. In Acts 17, 22, is everybody there? Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, you can read it with me, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. A lot of religion out there. For as I was passing through, now I want you to understand, he proclaimed this as religious. What was he doing? He was mocking them because they were worshiping false gods. I see you're really religious. <laughs> no. He was mocking them. For as I was passing through and concerning the objects of your worship, I've even found an altar with the instruction. To the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of the heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshiped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, since he gives all life, breath, and all things. <clears throat> and he has made from one blood every nation of men who dwell on the face of the earth. And has determined their pre-appointed times and boundaries of their dwellings. So that they should seek the Lord and hope that they might grope for him and find him. Though he is not far from each of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As also some of your prophets or poets have said. For we are also his offspring. Therefore since we are the offspring of God. We ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or any of your images that you created. Something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly these times of stupidity and ignorance God has overlooked. But now commands all men everywhere to turn from those things. Repent. Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. The temple made by God. Not by hands. And John 16. He's rebuilding the tabernacle. Hallelujah. Now, the participation of our cooperation... With the Spirit of God is what's a rebuilding. Amen. That's why he says you got to be careful to make sure you're not building anything on the things of old that we've been delivered from or on gold or silver or anything to that degree. That's not what it's built on. It's built a spiritual dwelling place. Amen. Not a storehouse. Not a warehouse. It is a spiritual dwelling place for God Almighty. In John 16, verse 5, Jesus said to him, Now I go away to him who sent me, and none of you ask me where I'm going. But because I have said this, these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin 
and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the ruler of this world is already judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you can't bear them yet until you have the Holy Spirit who will give you understanding and interpretation correctly. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will guide you into all truth. So why do people make stupid decisions and mistakes? Because they're not allowing the Spirit to lead them. They're allowing emotion to. More people make more emotional decisions than they do spirit decisions. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine, therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. And a little while you will not see me again, and a little while and you will see me, because I go to the Father. The helper of the, or the indwelling presence of God is to put things in holy order and causes us to agree with the removal of things by our cooperation until the temple becomes a sanctuary. Is everybody okay? All right. So the Holy Spirit to help the helper is the indwelling presence that is going to clean us up. That's why you catch the fish first, then you clean it. Amen? <laughs> and so in this process, you and I, the Holy Spirit is going to begin to remove all of this corruption. There are things that we've been harboring, that we've been stuffing in for years. There may be offenses. There may be all kinds. It doesn't matter what it is. Sins, transgression, it doesn't matter. Most of it is unforgiveness and bitterness. Associated with an individual or a place or something that occurred. Offense. All of those things. Which are the most harboring things that are put down and over and covered up for many, many years. Something so, somebody said to you, even when you were four or five years old, you could have said something. Somebody could have said something to you. Even though you responded, sticks and stones may break my bones, but your words ain't going to hurt me. But they did. <laughs> Amen. Those things were all put in. Harbored over. Even though we forgive and bless all these people that, Lord, I forgive everyone. Well, there's still some things that you really don't know you have forgot you forgive yet. You're still holding on to them because they're still triggered. They're still triggering people's reactions instead of responses towards the ways of God. Amen? So he says, we're going to get rid of all of these things. The helper, your indwelling presence of God Almighty is going to put things in holy order and cause us to agree with the removal of these corruptible things. That's what they're called, corruptible seeds. Amen? Until the temple becomes a sanctuary. Until it becomes a what? Sanctuary. Where God wants to dwell. Right now, listen, when you get born again, he puts up with us. So a spirit comes in. Amen? The Holy Spirit begins to come in and dwell. What is he doing? He's trying to prepare so that we can be empowered with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and take possession of every member of our body. That's where people lack the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They're not possessed yet. Or not every chamber or member is taken possession by the Holy Spirit. There are many members in our body, places, that the Holy Spirit wants to possess. Amen? And so till we become a sanctuary of the tabernacle of God. In Hebrews chapter 9. <clears throat> so cooperation with the Spirit is essential. Hallelujah. <laughs> is anybody here today? <laughs> Glorious. <clears throat> in Hebrews 9, verse 1. Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service in earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which was the lamb stand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And behind the second veil, 
the part of the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all, or the most holy place, which had the golden incense, the ark of the covenant of the overlaid with on all sides with gold, in which were a golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tabernacle and the tablets of the what? Covenant or the law. And above it was a cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot speak in detail. Now when these things had been thus prepared, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. But in, into the second part of the, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. Concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. But Christ came as a high priest of the good things to come, with a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and ashes of heifers Sprinkling uh, the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Again, the time of reformation or removal of the old, establishing the new with human participation as children of God and offsprings of the new creation and offsprings of the anointing. You know, can you imagine all of those in the, in, of the Old Testament that, especially the prophets that foreknew the things that were coming but could not participate in them. See, in, 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 in the Old Testament, the Spirit of the Lord had to come upon them to serve. So they had to go through rituals. They had to sacrifice they had to have, there had to be some kind of bloodshed. Amen? And that was established even from the garden. And the Lord showed Adam and Eve already immediately when they left that he sacrificed an animal and placed the skins on them for a covering. That was a part of the covering of the covenant. In Hebrews chapter 10. I was just there, wasn't I? In verse 11. Hebrews 10, verse 11. And every high priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, from the time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. Now, how are enemies going to be made footstool, his footstool? By his temples. Amen? For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us, for after he has said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them, after those days, says the Lord, I will put my what? Laws into their hearts and into their minds, and I will write them. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. Therefore, brethren, having the boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us, through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and what? 
good works. Not what? Forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. In other words, not forsaking the assembling in the sanctuary to allow the rebuilding of the tabernacle of God as temples of his dwelling place. Every time you and I come together, we get stronger. Every time we come together, the old man becomes dissolved. See, there's a dissolving process. We, we talked about this yesterday in our Saturday morning meeting. It's a powerful time yesterday. About the old man constantly dissolving and all the things of corruption dissolving. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Assembling. You know, when you're struggling through stuff, get in God's presence as much as possible. You'll find you'll have breakthrough. <laughs> Don't go to the phone. Go to the throne. The phone ain't going to rescue you. In fact, the person on the phone should tell you, get in God's presence. Get to that meeting. Quit playing self-righteousness when you're struggling. Oh, I can do it on my own. Oh, really? Then why are you still like that for two weeks? Verse 7. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7. But we have this what? Treasure and earth and vessel that the excellence of the power may be of God and not us. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake. Yes. That the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal body. So then death is working in us and life in you. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believe, therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that we who, he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things are for your sake, that grace having spread through the many may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Therefore, don't give up. Don't lose heart. Don't be a wimp. Fight. Get up. Don't run. Amen. Run to God's presence, not the phone. Now, don't run to food. Don't run to a movie. Amen. When you're struggling, run to God. Hallelujah. Therefore, don't lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, it's supposed to be for a moment. I think people just love to extend it. They become self-martyrs, you know. Oh, I'm doing this for Jesus. Jesus said, I never did that for you. I don't even, I don't, I didn't ask you to do that. You remember what, what he said to, um, anyways, he said to Joshua, get up. What are you doing down there, man? He said to Elijah, what are you doing? He said to many of the prophets because they got so freaky. You know, the enemy comes with fear and causes people to make wrong decisions. Fear is an emotion. Amen? People are making emotional decisions, and one of them is fear, anxiety, and stress. And God does know your circumstance. The problem is, is most people don't even know their own circumstance. They don't give God a, enough time to fix what needs to be fixed because they're so anxious. So our light affliction is supposed to be but for a moment, not forever, not for weeks. Amen? For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us. It's supposed to be working for us. A far more exceeding and, and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things that are which are seen are temporary. But the things which are not seen are eternal. So we are these earthen vessels, the power of God as his temple. We are monitors. You know, if you, in other words, heaven is looking through you here too. 
the Spirit of God is looking through you. Everything is being recorded wherever you go. You're like a moving recorder. Or a, what do you call those? Recorder. Movie projector. Everything's being recorded. No matter what's going on, wherever you are, everything's being recorded. And it's being written. But again, we are, we are the temple, the monitors, the, we are the judges, we are the avengers, we are the protectors. And we are the restrainers. And the builders of his more holy dwelling places with the new covenant is an end time movement of God right now. And Matthew 7. Hallelujah. And 24. Matthew 7, 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him a wise man who built his house on the rock. Jesus, the rock, the anointing. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and the beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be likened a foolish man who built his house on the sand, and the rain descended, and the Floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. In other words, that's why it's so important that we hear who, he who hears and obeys his building words. His, Jesus' words are building words on his power of the anointing on the foundation. So when Jesus speaks, it's helping us build. His foundation is the anointing. In Ephesians 2. See, there's a lot of people who hear but won't obey. They're, they do yes, 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 but there's a no, 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 no behind it. Or there's a me, me, me behind it. And an I, I, I. Hallelujah. Ephesians 2.19. Let's speak it, please. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, and whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, and whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. You know, as we begin to recognize this more and more and more, we should be more careful of things that we agree with. It. Amen? We don't want to contaminate this temple. That's where people grieve the Holy Spirit. That's why sometimes the, the process of rebuilding ceases and a person gets stuck because they're agreeing with things that grieve the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit will step back and say, okay, you want to stay that way for a while? When you finally repent and turn from that and acknowledge that area that you've done wrong in, and it doesn't even have to be sin. It could just be something we did that was wrongful. Does everybody understand? Even though we know that all, all wrongfulness is sin. But according to what we look at sin, you know, a lot of people use the excuse, well, I don't drink no more, I don't smoke no more, I don't do this no more, I don't do that no more. But what do you do? How's your attitude? How's your motives? What's your intents? Are you really submitting? Are you faithful? Are you an example? Are you a stumbling block? Those are areas where we are judged constantly. And those things will either stop that growth or promote the growth. Amen? Is everybody okay? You know, the word talks about going into the sanctuary. He says, and I'm not going to go to all the scriptures. He said there's help in the sanctuary. He said there's power and glory in the sanctuary. He said, when I, I was trying to understand everything, and when I came into the sanctuary, I got understanding. Amen? The, the majesty, 
He says, your ways of direction are in the sanctuary. In other words, in God's presence, things are imparted. You will get more in God's presence than you will get anything else. You can read the whole Bible inside and out and never understand all of it. But the Bible doesn't tell you what kind of car to buy, even though it talks about fury. Amen? So don't go out. You know, it doesn't mean you go out buy a fury, you know. It doesn't, it, it has a guideline of who you should marry according to the fruits. Amen. But most people get married un, unevenly yoked. And then there's trouble down the road. Again, even though we're talking about building the temple, God doesn't tell you what kind of house to buy. Amen. He's going to direct you and lead you by the spirit. He knows what's best for me and you, but we got to allow him. It doesn't say, unless the Lord builds the what? House, we labor in vain. But anxiousness, fear, anxiety, stress will always mislead an individual. Hallelujah. 1 Peter chapter 2. Almost done. Hang in there. It's a good day to die. Hebrew. 1 Peter chapter 2. I just want to know if you're paying attention. Verse 9. Let's speak it together. But you are what? You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now people of God. Who did not obtain mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you, sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Second Corinthians 6. Now, sometimes people don't realize that even their healings have been delayed. Everything is associated with positioning. Everything. In the spirit realm, there's position. The word tells us that we are seated in heavenly places. Those are positions. There's always something awaiting for you, but you must access into it. You must press into it, just like pressing into the presence of God, into the glory of God. You know, so many times we look at God's bringing something to us, but actually we're bringing, we're going to him. We're meeting him in a specific place where he can release something. The word says after you've done what he's asked you to do, he releases his promise. He's got little chores for us to do. Those are uh, uh, self, those are cooperating chores that he's asking us, little events that he's asking us to do that help cooperate with the removal and dissolving of self. And anything that's corrupt. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14, would you read it with me? It says what? Do not be unevenly yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? And what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them. I will walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. If they do what? If they come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters. Again, that indwelling presence is what's establishing the temple. It's cleaning out everything. It's preparing a sanctuary for the presence of God. So in this indwelling presence is to rebuild. The outdwelling presence is to restore. I'm going to say it again. The indwelling presence is to rebuild. Remember, we're rebuilding. God's rebuilding the tabernacle. The outdwelling presence is to restore. So there's a time where God, as you press into the things that you're submissive, you're obedient, he meets you or the Spirit of God will come upon you. 
to do something, to serve. Isaiah 61. Indwelling presence is to what? Rebuild. And the outdwelling presence is to restore. What's the, yeah, what are you restoring? A person's life. You're reconciling them to God. Amen? Isaiah 61 and verse 1. And then one more scripture. Oh, hallelujah. You almost made it. But you can do all things through Christ's strength, don't you? Let's speak it so we can make it. <laughs> the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to com comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. That's the outward presence. Amen? Remember, the inward presence rebuilds. The outward presence restores. And I'm going to close at Psalm 149. One forty-nine, And we can speak this together. Psalm 149. Starting at verse 1. Is anybody there yet? Let's speak it. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song and his praise in the assembly of the saints. Hmm, that's called gathering. Let Israel rejoice in their maker and let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name with a dance. That's why we love to dance. David danced. He danced in his underwear. I do encourage you not to do that here. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Let them sing praises to him with the timbrel and harp. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the humble with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud on their beds. Heck, you're out of your bed now, right? When you come here, you ought to be screaming it out, man. Let them sing aloud on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. To do what? To execute vengeance on the nations and punishments on the people. Who? Wait a minute. Who's going to do that? Us, the temple. To bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. Man, I do that every single morning. To execute on them the written judgment every morning. This honor have all of his saints. Praise the Lord. We are warriors, third dimensional warriors, amen? We are temples, tabernacles, and we have a covenant that's everlasting. So as God is rebuilding the tabernacle, know that all the things are coming together. He's putting that place together for us to be a dwelling place so that the presence of God inside is rebuilding and the anointing outside is restoring. Amen. Praise God. Father, we thank you for your word. We are honored and blessed. We ask that you seal this with the blood and bring to remembrance what you taught us today that we may put it into practice for your glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen.